Hi folks, um, I hope you're having a good day and uh, we will begin our study in about four minutes. If you have any comments or questions or ideas or thoughts or prayer requests, uh, you can leave those here um, in the comments. Uh, as I've explained before, I don't always see all of the comments, but I see some of them. So um, if you have any anything you'd like to share, please do so. Uh, we'll start in just a few minutes. All right, it's nine o'clock. Uh, welcome to everybody. Hi, Don. I see you on there, Don Stallard. Good to see you. Glad you all are here. We're going to be taking a look at John chapter 6 tonight. Um, it's a pivotal chapter, um, and we'll talk about why as we, uh, as we go through it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, once again, we are privileged to be together with you in your word tonight. And we ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit would guide us and... Uh, and lead us. Um, we pray this evening uh, for all of those who um, are combating the coronavirus, um, the researchers, including, uh, and also nurses and doctors and others. I mean, they are doing the work of heroes. 
and uh, we thank you for them. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, also that you would uh, guide our churches so that in this circumstance, um, we will exploit, uh, we will use those opportunities that you give to us to share the good news of Jesus, um, who people need more desperately now than ever. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our discussion in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Living Water folks, I want to tell you, some of you may have gotten a prayer request for Steve uh, Nikolai. He went to the hospital night before last um, to Southview. Uh, he had symptoms of what they now believe is something called uh, transient, let's see, transient global amnesia. And uh, hi, Nancy. And uh, uh, he was discharged yesterday, he said he slept like a baby last night. Um, he's doing pretty good, all things considered. So um, uh, continue to pray for Steve, for Giselle, for Ryan and their family. Uh, but he's in, he's in good spirits. I heard from him this evening. Well, I just saw something I meant to send and didn't. You'll be interested in that, Terry and Deb. Um, anyway, here we are now um, in John chapter 6, and I, I'd like to set the table a little bit, and there's a little bit of a pun in that because we're going to have the feeding of the 5,000. But I'd like to set this chapter up. Uh, first of all, it, it begins with Jesus and the disciples going from Jerusalem uh, across the the Sea of Galilee, which is also, John says, the Sea of uh, Tiberias. And uh, uh, they have spent the winter. Remember, we said last night that they were there for the Feast of Booths in chapter 5 in Jerusalem. Now um, they've spent the winter in Jerusalem. John does not record any of Jesus' activities from that winter. But remember, John is the one who says, at the end of his book that Jesus did many other signs. And there's another place, I think John 21, where he says, if, if you recorded everything that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world. So he, he is willing to glide past uh, uh, events. And uh, he's cutting to a very important event. So he's, they've spent the winter, Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem. They cross the Sea of Galilee and they go to the other side. The region that they go to is someplace close to uh, Gilgal. Uh, Gilgal uh, is, is the place that uh, Joshua and the people of God uh, came into the promised land after their wilderness wanderings. And it is the point at which uh, the manna ceased. God provided them with manna, which they baked into cakes like bread, remember, uh, throughout their wilderness wanderings, even when they grumbled. Keep the grumbling part uh, in mind here. Um, and so even as they grumbled, God provided for them. This goes back to what we talked about last night about how God initiates things and God does not forget his covenant or his love for the human race, even when we uh, completely forget about him. And so uh, uh, now they're in this region that is just rife with this history. Remember that Joshua's name in Hebrew was Yeshua. And that Jesus' name in Aramaic and Hebrew is Yeshua. And the name means Yahweh saves. And uh, remember, Joshua led the people into the promised land. And Jesus is the one, the new Joshua, the new Savior, who is going to lead us into the kingdom of God uh, through our faith in him. Uh, so that lay in the background. The other thing that lay in the background is that it's time for a Passover. I misstated myself a few uh, days back, I think, 
Um, there are multiple Passovers uh, recounted in John's gospel. So um, here's another one. Um, so let's begin, and there, there are more things that we can flesh out, but let's just begin. John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. It's just a Roman name for it. Um, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them and uh, gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is coming into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, there's so much going on in this passage. Uh, first of all, it should be mentioned that the, the feeding of five, the 5,000 is the only miraculous sign that is recorded by all four gospel writers. In fact, Matthew and Mark tell us there were two separate incidents, one in which Jesus fed 5,000 men and more, uh, and 4,000 men and more. Um, the reason I believe that the gospel writers mention 5,000 men and not the others who would have been with them is because 5,000 men was about the um, uh, size of, of, a, of a Roman legion. So here is an army trying to force Jesus to become a king. By the way, um, in the original Greek in which this passage is written, um, it does not use an article. Now, there, there's not a, a definite article, V, nor is there an indefinite article, an A, as in the king or a king. It is make him king. And when there is no definite article, almost always, there are some exceptions, almost always you should assume a king. So that that phrase uh, conveys the crowd's estimation of Jesus. They're going to force him to be a king. Remember, Jesus says he does not trust himself to anyone. And he knows uh, man. He does not accept glory from human beings. He only accepts the glory, glory that God gives to him. And God only gives him glory by his faithfulness to God the Father. And so Jesus is um, uh, not down with uh, the desire of the crowd, this, this army, if you will, to make him a king who will do their bidding. And we see the intentions of their heart as we go through this chapter. They, they really don't have a high estimation of Jesus. They see him as a means to their ends. 
And there are a lot of people who have today a utilitarian view uh, of the faith. In fact, I just read a comment by a guy who came to faith in the Lutheran church after having been involved in other Christian traditions in the past. And he said, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, um, the Lutheran tradition is that, you know, there, there's this false piety that some Christians practice, but Lutheranism is, uh, uh, preaches an utter dependence on Christ and not as a means to an end. He said, therefore, I don't hear sermons in Lutheran churches about how to be successful or how to be powerful, right? Or how to get people to like you. It's, it's about Christ and Christ alone. So in this passage, Jesus and the disciples cross the Galilee. It's Passover time. He decides he's going to celebrate a, a kind of Passover with these people. And he baits Philip. Uh, Philip, remember, was one of the first people to follow him. And he was the one who went and got Nathaniel. Uh, but Jesus decides, Jesus uses questions to reel people in. So he says, you know, where are we going to get money to buy the food we need? Keep in mind, this is in the section of Israel where the people of God first came, uh, uh, entered out of the wilderness. And from the time they entered the promised land, it was then up to them to... Uh, to grow their crops, but God promised them a land, uh, you know, flowing with milk and honey that was, that was good for crops and so forth. So uh, Philip says, you know, 200 denarii or denarii, I guess, is 200 days worth of wages for a common laborer. Hi, John. Um, seeing you there. And yes, I mentioned Nancy earlier, but hi, Nancy. Good to see all of you. Um, so anyway, he, he's saying over a half a year's wages would only give people a, you know, a little scrap of food. And uh, Andrew, trying to be helpful, you know, mentions there's this kid. But he says, that's, that's not going to feed this crowd. That's when Jesus has had them sit down. They sit down. And what's interesting, it says, uh, verse 12 and when they had eaten their fill he told his disciples gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost here we we should do the old exercise that we used to do in school of comparing and contrasting yes this is comparable now here in the promised land to the miracle of the manna which was not in the promised land given to god's people there is that thing god's providing but Remember that the people of God were told, only gather up what you can eat in a day's time. Don't try to gather up more. It will rot if you do that. But here's Jesus, and he performs a miracle where there are leftovers. He says, gather up the leftovers. Why? Because here is the, this, this is God in the flesh. And now this new covenant, this, this new thing that God is doing, this new creation he's establishing huh, is more abundant and, and, and fuller than we can possibly imagine, comprehend, or even take in. Huh? It's way beyond our imagining. Uh, it's, it's like Jesus talking in the Gospel of Luke, you know, uh, 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 shaken and spilling over, right? In, in referring to the kind of harvesting action where there's so much you you can't possibly eat it all, right? It's kind of like uh, Thanksgiving was at my my grandma's house when I was a kid. Um, so they gathered them up, and of course there were twelve fragments and uh, twelve baskets. Uh, twelve is a very important number. Five is an important number. It's the number of books in the Torah. And it says, when the people saw the sign, they said, this is a prophet. So they don't, they kind of get him. They don't quite get him. Uh, but what they really see is, we can use this guy. So now uh, Jesus eludes them and uh, decides to uh, hide out rather than accepting uh, 
a kingship from them, but because his kingship can only be conferred upon him by the Father. Verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea in Capernaum, to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. So it's, remember the imagery of night, dark, light day that you have in the Gospel of John, and they're without Jesus, or so they think. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. You know, the other gospel writers talk about, you know, Peter, Lord, call me out. And said, that, that, John is not saying that didn't happen. He's just not narrating that. What is important to him here is um, the echoes of Genesis 1. Remember, Genesis begins with two different uh, ways of talking about the creation. Genesis 1 begins um, with the account of the, this, this primordial chaos. It's just a storm, a raging storm. Uh, wherever there is not peace, the peace of God, there is disorder. And then God's spirit moves over the waters, you remember, and brings about peace, order, and life. That's what God does when his Holy Spirit uh, acts on us. So here's uh, here are the disciples out in this boat, uh, terrified, even though they are seasoned fishermen, uh, some of them anyway. And they see Jesus, they're terrified, you know, of that. I mean, when was the last time you saw someone walking on the water? And so he says, don't be afraid. And as soon as he gets into the boat, they're on the other side. Uh, God is our peace, and he is with us even when we don't know he's there, even when we don't recognize it. Hello, Mrs. Mason. Good to see you this evening. Glad you're here, too. Uh, now, uh, hi, Kim. How are you? More uh, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, Oklahoma folks. Good to see you. Uh, well, kind of. Good to be seen, I guess, uh, virtually. Uh, anyway, there have been some uh, hints uh, of a sacramental uh, or a Holy Communion aspect to, um, to this uh, chapter already. Remember, one of the things I pointed out is that it, it, in John's Gospel, he does not recount Jesus' baptism, and he does not recount during the course of the Last Supper uh, Jesus' institution of Holy Communion. But the thing is shot through with uh, sacramental references. It's going to become heavy duty now. John 6, verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Um, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, remember that in the original Greek is amen, 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 amen. And when Jesus says that, it, it, he's saying, you can bank on this. This is the absolute truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, because, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Um, so uh, let me just stop right there. What he's saying to them is, 
I know what you're doing. I know what you're about. You are not following me because you saw in that uh, miraculous thing I did yesterday a sign of who I am. You're seeing it as uh, an indication that I can do your bidding. I can give you what you want. Hi, Dick. Good to see you, too. Uh, so uh, he, he, he's chastising them because they're not... They're not in it to follow the Lord. They're in it for themselves. They're in it for short-term gain. They want their bellies filled again, right? Okay. Jesus then talks about bread. Verse 27. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. You know, in ancient time, to set your seal on someone or to set your seal on, say, a proclamation was to give your authority to that person or to that edict. Jesus is saying God the Father has set his seal on him. This is more of Jesus saying, as he says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And so he's saying you know, I, I find this too. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, you know, um, people occasionally will will try to send out emails in a person's name. This has happened to me several times and try to get people to send them gift cards or whatever. I think about all the work it takes to do that. They would be better off, uh, you know, doing honest work, honorable work. I mean, if they're that ingenious, they probably could do some pretty interesting or amazing things. Jesus is saying, you're doing all this toil just to get food that lasts for a day or a few hours? He said, you should be after the food that endures to eternal life, which he is here to give to them. All right, move on to verse 29, because, or yeah, 28. This is called cluelessness. Verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them. This is the passage I've referred to several times already. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. That's the work of God. So they said to him, here's the clueless part. <laughs> then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Remember who these people are. They're the ones he just fed. They're the ones who just witnessed the sign. Give us a sign, All right? Uh, you living water folks and probably Bethlehem folks and everybody else have heard me say this before, but one of my professors at, at seminary, Ron Hall, said he knows that if he were around Jesus at the time Jesus performed a miracle, he would say to him, do it again slower. <laughs> it's, it, it's so it's hard for us to believe. But the problem here with these folks is uh, they're following the sign. They're not following the giver of the sign or the thing to which the sign points, which is the Lordship of Jesus. All right. Jesus says to them in verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. This is like the woman at the well. Give me this water always so I don't have to come back to this well or ever thirst again. They still are not getting it. He's saying, I am the bread of heaven. Give us this bread. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst but I said to you that you have uh, seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. The word there, hi, Julie, uh, and, and uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, Keith, right? Right. Uh, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, 
but raise it up on the last day. He's saying, look, the Father gives me people and I'm never letting them go. If they come to me and trust in me, I will never let them go. But the problem with these people is they're not truly coming to him. They're what I call spiritual grazers. You know, spiritual grazers. They're the people who kind of, they, they feed at the trough on the edges, but they never make a commitment. They have an allergy to committing themselves because if they commit themselves, then they have to follow Jesus. They have to really pay heed to him when he calls us to daily repentance and renewal, right? They really have to take him seriously when he says, love God, love neighbor. Not that they can do it in their own power. None of us can. But uh, when we follow Jesus, he gives us the power. But the problem is, these are not things we want to do. We don't want to do these things. We want just enough of Jesus to have what some people call heavenly fire insurance, but not enough of him to, for him to transform us in this life or the next. You know, we all have imperfect faith. But these folks are uh, playing games with God. And I think, quite honestly, many, many people do. And sometimes I do some days. Huh? But you can't fool God. He knows our hearts. There's one of my sisters, Diane. Hi, Diane. All right, we go on. Uh, verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. If you have your Bibles in front of you, underline the word grumbled. Because they are echoing the grumbling of the people in the wilderness. These people are in a kind of wilderness area, but it's within the, the territory of ancient Israel. And even there, they're grumbling against God. Verse 42, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I want to stop there for a second. None of us can manufacture faith. I cannot convince myself to believe in Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit operating through the word of God that creates faith within us. I cannot resolve to say, I've decided to follow Jesus. That's not how it works. Jesus calls me and I turn to him and he is like um, the, the gravity of the sun pulling him uh, pulling us to himself. And it's he who manufactures faith within us. That's why 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says what it says. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. So we can't even take credit for our faith. I don't even believe because I've decided to believe. I believe because Jesus made it impossible for me not to believe. That's how it works. That's why our witness is so important. The incessance of our witness so that people find Jesus unavoidable. Hmm? Okay. He says, whoever, uh, verse 40. Uh, oh, I skipped way ahead, didn't I? Uh, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, that is Jesus himself. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, this is communion stuff. Remember when Jesus institutes the sacrament of Holy Communion. I've said this before. He did not say, this symbolizes my body. This symbolizes my blood. He said, this is my blood. This is my body. And as I, you've heard me say, 
Jesus knows what the definition of is, is. He doesn't have to be educated on that point, and he doesn't have to be revised. And his body, his blood gives us life. So you see what I'm saying? John is fraught with this uh, sacramental language and teaching on the sacraments. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh, his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Only he has life, right? We are dead in our tras trespasses. Only he can give us life. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Abides, there's that word again, menane, remain. He remains in us, and we remain in him, because he comes to us, not just through his word, but physically in the sacraments, in the water of holy baptism, when the Holy Spirit gives us new life, and in the bread and the wine, when his body and blood is fed to us, and we taste and see the goodness of the Lord. All right. Uh, verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So here's a deal. He's saying, uh, I'm the bread of life. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, verse 60. Let's, let's, um, let's make a point here. Disciples here refers to everyone who believes in Jesus. The word disciple in the original Greek in which John and all the New Testament writers composed their uh, works was mathetes, which means student. And it has much more, it's not so much the idea of being a student sitting and taking notes in a class. It's mean that you, it means that you, you followed this rabbi, right? You followed him wherever he went. And so uh, the disciples refers to more than just the 12. The 12 were the apostles. The disciples are people who at some level believe in Jesus and are following him and are seeking to learn from him. But watch what happens. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? It is a hard saying. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling, there it is again, you might want to underline that word, about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. He's talking to disciples. Some of you who do not believe. Luther talked about the church within the church. You know, there's the church. There are people who show up for church. And then within the church is the fellowship of believers who truly believe. That's not for us to decide. Jesus lets the wheat and the tares grow together and he'll sort it out at the end of time. All right. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who do not believe and who it was who would betray him. Think of that. Even at this point in his ministry, and we can infer always, he knew who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Right? If you're only following me to make me a king you can use, the Father's not at work, the Spirit's not at work, the Word's not at work. Right? Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer with, walked with him. 
there that's an important point walk with him the word in greek for walking around which jesus does and people follow him is parapeteo we get a word in our english language we've transliterated over in english parapetetic it's a compound word peri meaning around we have perimeter right is is uh, has that prefix and uh, pateo is walk walk around they no longer walked around with jesus what they were no longer following him why they couldn't take this saying why not well they found the whole idea of eating this flesh strange and offensive they found the idea that he was claiming to be equal to god something they couldn't believe and most of all, because he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. If our faith, faith, requires us, excuse me, if our faith requires God to do what we want him to do, that's not faith. Jesus teaches us, remember, Thy will be done. And he also lives it in the garden. Remember, he said, I want this cup to pass. I don't want to go through this, but your will, not my own. Right? So uh, they don't want Jesus. They don't want any part of this new thing that he's doing. They just wanted some grub. They just wanted him to do what they asked him to do. They didn't want a Lord. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. The reason this is such an important chapter, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that this is a turning point. Um, Jesus has faced opposition previously, and it's clear, it was clear in the temple that the leaders in the temple didn't like him. And the guy who had his finger wet finger to the wind the, the man he healed of paralysis understood which way the winds of the powerful were blowing but now he's offended the masses and in the midst of that he's conscious of the fact that there is a devil even among the 12 who will betray him but Peter says, where else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And notice, Peter doesn't say you have the signs of eternal life. That's a very healthy thing for Peter to say. Remember, Jesus has warned us against following him just because of the signs. But to follow him for what the signs point to. That's why in the Gospel of John, after Jesus performs signs, almost always there comes a kind of excursus in which he explains what the sign means, as he did in this chapter. Well, I'm going to say it again tonight. Uh, I've gone way longer than I uh, expected to. A lot of stuff going on in this chapter, longer chapter. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? In this time, we know we need you. We need you in ways that we maybe haven't realized before. And we need you for life. You're the only one who can give life life with God in this world and life with God for all eternity. 
your word brings life. Help us each day to turn to your word and receive um, this abundant life, a life with you uh, that the world can't give. And we pray these things in, oh, and I also want to pray, Lord, that you'd help us to lift Jesus up every day in as many ways as we can so that others can hear your call, so that the Father can usher them to you and you can usher them by your grace into their kingdom. Thank you for all of the folks who have been watching her this evening. Bless each and every one of them. And uh, thank you for your word in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. Thank you very much for being with me. I'll see you tomorrow night at nine o'clock.